Get on your knees. Get on your knees. In South Carolina, a family is taken hostage as part of a brazen bank robbery. Police track down the suspects, but they can't seem to keep the leader in jail. The FBI and police in four states are determined to stop him, but the armed fugitive is relentless in his struggle to stay free. When a bank teller arrived at her parents' home, the gunmen were already there. The robbers held her family hostage and forced her to empty a bank vault. If she didn't comply, she could lose everyone she loved. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Even when authorities caught the crime's mastermind, they couldn't hold him. Soon he was back in action, with the FBI once again on his trail. The Savannah River marks the state line separating Augusta, Georgia from North Augusta, South Carolina. On the South Carolina side, on a Friday afternoon in October 1995, Parker and Brenda Shaw returned home with their granddaughter, Brianna. They watched Brianna on Friday afternoons when her mother, Amy Shaw, worked late as a bank teller. Parker tried to open the garage, but the remote door opener wasn't working. Not knowing someone was there, he went in the house to open the garage from inside. The two intruders quickly bound Parker with duct tape, then forced him into the bedroom. Outside, Brenda got tired of waiting. With Brianna, she began to walk towards the front door. When the garage finally opened, The man forced Brenda into the bedroom where her husband was being held by the other two intruders. The gunman stole money and credit cards from the frightened couple. But then the one who was clearly the leader announced he had really come for the Shaw's daughter, Amy, and the money at her bank. They would wait for her. The armed intruders held the Shaws for more than an hour. Oh, lady, back. Sit down. Sit down. At 7 p.m., right. the lead gunman ordered Brenda into the living room, All right. okay. leaving one of his men to guard her husband and granddaughter. At the front window, they watched for Amy. They knew exactly when she was to arrive. For Amy Shaw, it was an ordinary Friday evening. The gunman ordered Brenda to the front door. Usually it was unlocked, so Amy was surprised she couldn't get in. She knew right away something was wrong. The leader grabbed Amy. 
He told her he had been watching them for some time. He knew their schedules, when they were vulnerable, everything. He began interrogating Amy about the security system at the bank. And do you have them? Do you have the code? From her training, she knew it was best to comply with the demands. She said she could get him into the bank, but it took two codes to open the vault, and she only had one. He said they'd deal with that when they got there and warned her if anything went wrong, her family could get hurt. The leader announced he was taking Amy to the bank and told his men to wait for his call. Her parents and little girl could only hope that she would not be harmed. As they left, the kidnapper removed his mask to avoid looking suspicious in public. At gunpoint, Amy drove across the Savannah River from South Carolina into Georgia and to the bank where she worked. The gunman ordered her to circle the bank slowly so he could check if a cleaning crew was inside. Pulling up next to the automated teller machine, Amy hoped to catch the kidnapper's image on its security camera. Deciding it was clear, he ordered her to drive to the back door. He told her that when they got inside, she was to explain all of her actions so he would know she wasn't setting off any alarms, and warned her again not to make any mistakes. Inside, she showed him the alarm she could disable. But as she had explained, she could not open the main vault door alone. She had one combination, but a co-worker had the other. The kidnapper reminded Amy that her family would remain safe only if he could get inside the vault. Get to the vault. At the Shaw residence, the intruders moved the family to the living room where they could watch the front. The Shaws hoped it would end peacefully, but the men seemed to grow agitated, their guns at the ready. The handgun had gone off accidentally. The intruders worried the sound had alerted neighbors. And their concern mounted as another car pulled up to the house. It was Amy's brother-in-law and sister, and their young daughter, arriving for a visit. Mom. They were taken as soon as they entered the house. The gunman now had six hostages. At the bank, the lead assailant ordered Amy to call her co-worker for the second combination. Hello? Hey, this is Amy. When Amy asked, the co-worker hesitated, not understanding what was happening. Amy tried to explain that her family was being held hostage. Get me the combination. The gunman took over, threatening to come get the code himself. Okay, okay, just calm down. Fearing for Amy's safety, the co-worker gave her the second combination. The gunman made sure the woman stayed on the line so she couldn't call police. Amy nervously punched in the second part of the combination. 
But the vault remained locked. You gave me the wrong combination. Make it work or else. She carefully tried again. And the door opened. The robber had Amy make sure the co-worker stayed on the line. And he ordered her to point out which bins held bait money that was sequentially numbered or rigged with exploding die packs. He left that cash alone. After the robber loaded up the money, he ordered Amy to call her parents home on a second line. The leader ordered his men to take care of things at the house, then leave and page him when they were clear. And get out. He took off with more than $86,000. Once he was gone, Amy set off the alarm to bring help. Then, frantic with worry, she called home. Her mother warned her not to call police. The armed men were still there. But it was too late. She already had. The gunman checked the terrified family's bindings. It seemed like they were going to leave. But one hesitated. There were six witnesses to the crime. Yo, come on, man. Let's go. At 8 p.m., Richmond County Sheriff's officers responded to the bank in Georgia and learned the real crime was across the river. The lead investigator was Kenneth Booz. We relayed all the information that we had to the Edgefield County Sheriff's Office and told them that there was a possibility that the family was still being held hostage. Edgefield County, South Carolina Sheriff's Investigator Don Bullock got the call. We had a family hostage situation. Respond was code one. That's everything you got, fast as you can get there. The family had called, saying the gunman had left, but the deputies had to be sure. Sir, step back. The deputies checked the house for the intruders. They were gone. They were safe. Uh, nobody was hurt. Physically, they weren't hurt, but mentally, they had to be shattered. They really went through an ordeal. The Shaws described the men as best they could. They never saw faces and knew only they were African-American males. The men were armed and aggressive. Come on, man. Let's go. What you doing? One had held a gun to Parker's head. Look, I'm out of here, man. Let's go. But the shot never came. When the assailants left, the family freed themselves and waited for police to arrive. Parker explained that the gunman took the keys to his son-in-law's car and described what they were wearing. Deputies put out an APB. As with any bank robbery, the Richmond County authorities notified the FBI. Special Agent Jerry Jones of the Augusta, Georgia resident agency arrived to interview Amy. She described the leader of the group and the direction in which he fled. She said she might have captured an image of him and told Special Agent Jones about the camera on the ATM. 
she tried to get him into a position where the camera may take a photograph of him. As it turns out, the camera was activated only when one puts one's card into the machine, so that didn't work. The cameras inside didn't catch him either. At the North Augusta crime scene, investigator Bullock arrived and was briefed on the search for evidence. Technicians from the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division had found oily shoe prints on the garage floor and photographed them for future comparison if suspects were located. From inside the house, technicians recovered a single cartridge from the bullet fired in the living room. It was from a 38 caliber handgun, but had no prints on it. Attempts to recover the assailant's fingerprints elsewhere failed as well, since they had worn gloves throughout the crime. At the top of the driveway, investigators located a vehicle stuck in a ditch. The two suspects, when they left the house, they were going to take a car, and they got the key from the victims in the house, and their haste to back out of the driveway, they backed into a ditch and could not get the car out of the ditch, so they, had to, they left on foot. The technicians recovered foreign fingerprints from the vehicle. More evidence to compare to any later suspects. Nearby, they located several items they believed had been dropped by the fleeing gunman. There were several weapons, including a shotgun and a 357 Magnum. Clothes, masks, and gloves found in the bushes matched what the assailants reportedly had worn. Without the clothes, police didn't have much of a description of the suspects. They updated the already vague APB. Three African-American males, two probably on foot, one in a dark blue sedan, armed and considered dangerous. In 1995, South Carolina and Georgia authorities sought three masked men who held the Shaw family hostage and robbed a bank. Within an hour of the 911 call, an off-duty deputy was en route to the Shaw house when he heard the revised APB. He spotted two men, roughly fitting the description, walking away from the neighborhood where the Shaws lived. Hey guys, let me talk to you for just a second. Where are you guys coming from? The deputy questioned the pair, according to Sheriff's investigator Don Bullock. They asked him what they were doing there, and they said, we were up at the church playing basketball, and they had no basketball and uh, no transportation. Backup soon arrived. The deputies knew the church mentioned had no lights on its basketball court. And uh, being that time of night, it was dark. The red flags just flew up. It was, you know, he put two and two together. If you don't mind, can we just take them back around the corner in your car since I don't have a case? Come on, guys, we'll just clear you up real quick and that'd be not good. The young men agreed to go to a police staging area near the Shaw House for further questioning. They were identified as Daniel Evans and Lamarco Roscoe. At the bank, FBI Special Agent Jerry Jones received word of the two men in custody. I elected to leave the bank because the victim teller was comfortable and uh, secure. So I left uh, the bank and went over to South Carolina to interview the two suspects. Jones made it to the police staging area about the same time as the suspects. He and Sheriff's investigator Kenneth Booz knew that with more than one suspect involved, 
it was best to talk to them separately. We separated them because most of the time they'll start breaking down, but they'll start wondering what the other suspect has told us. When they start realizing that the other one might be talking, then they want to be the first one to get on the bandwagon and start cooperating. The men had been unable to give details about the church where they had allegedly been playing basketball. And investigators sensed they were involved in the crime. Special Agent Jones began with Lamarco Roscoe. You develop a, uh, a concept of what their greatest fear is, some weakness they may have in their, uh, their past or, or, or their, uh, uh, their family or something of that sort. And in this particular case, it was fear of the death penalty that got Roscoe's attention. Jones knew Amy Shaw was safe, but gambled that Roscoe did not. He told him his primary concern was Amy's safety. I told him that he needed to know that if the third robber killed her, that he would face the electric chair for his complicity in the robbery. So everything I told him was the truth. My primary interest was the safety and welfare of the victim teller. And it is true that had the third robber killed Amy Shaw, they would both have faced the death penalty. The suspect soon admitted his involvement in the crime. When asked for the name of the leader of the group, he said he only knew him by his first name, Chris, and believed his last name started with a J. Another law enforcement officer who was familiar with a number of narrative wells in, in uh, the Augusta area recognized the name and actually asked if that was in fact Christopher Jabert, which he, he replied that it was. Jones then interviewed the second suspect, Daniel Evans. I told him that his accomplice had already confessed, and uh, he immediately uh, began to tell me the story of what happened that night. I wanted him to confirm the name of the third suspect without prompting, and he immediately gave up Christopher Jaberk by name. In talking to Roscoe and Evans, investigators realized the two were obviously the followers, and Jaberk was in charge. They weren't the masterminds of this bank robbery. They were, uh, in my opinion, they were mastermind stooges. They didn't appear to have much knowledge of what was going on, except for they had been with Jaberk several times in the past few days, looking at different banks, coming up with different plans on how to pull this one off. When he was finished with the preliminary interviews, Jones learned a pager number had been recovered from one of the suspects. He asked an officer to call the number. When the return call came back, the officer identified himself. The caller said his name was Chris Jaberk. When asked, he said he was 100 miles away in Mount Vernon, Georgia. Jaberk was defensive and asked the officer if he was being accused of something. Then he hung up. Investigators headed for Jaberk's house right away. As it turns out, law enforcement was very familiar with Christopher Jaberk, knew where the residence was without any prompting. If he was the lead kidnapper, he now knew police were looking for him. And with a head start and $86,000 in cash, Christopher Jaberk could be anywhere. In October 1995, authorities were seeking Christopher Jaberk, wanted for armed kidnapping and bank robbery. At the request of FBI agents and Richmond County deputies, Jaberk's mother called her son on his cell phone and advised him to come talk to authorities. 
Around 1 a.m., he arrived with his girlfriend. Although only 19 years old, Jaberk was already on a five-year probation for burglary and escape from a detention center. The investigators took him in for questioning. His girlfriend agreed to come in too. At the sheriff's department, FBI Special Agent Jerry Jones questioned Jaberk about the kidnapping of the Shaw family and the bank robbery in Georgia. I got a phone call from the bank Jaberk admitted knowing the two confessed gunmen, Daniel Evans and Lamarco Roscoe, but denied any involvement in the crime. He said he was in Mount Vernon, Georgia, with his girlfriend and another female friend at the time in question. Jaberk at first gave the two girls as his alibi, claiming to have gone with one of the girls to pick up the other girl and then come back to Augusta, Georgia, and stated that he was with the two girls the entire day. And even after they arrived back in Augusta, Georgia, they went to a movie together, all three of them. Temporarily halting the interview, Jones went to talk to the girlfriend and the second friend who had come to the station at the request of investigators. The two girls, when interviewed, uh, declined to corroborate that, uh, that alibi. All right. <clears throat> the two girls don't back up the store. Jaberk quickly tried to come up with a new alibi, according to Richmond County Sheriff's investigator Kenneth Booz. He said that he couldn't tell us his whereabouts at the time of the robbery because he was involved in some other criminal activity. It was a drug deal in Atlanta, Georgia, according to him. Two guys named Roscoe and Abel. Jaberk's new story didn't convince anyone. Federal authorities charged him with six counts, including conspiracy, carjacking, kidnapping, and armed bank robbery. After further interviews with Jaberk, uh, he finally started cooperating and told us that he was involved in this, this robbery and kidnapping, and that uh, he was actually the one that did it, but he wasn't the mastermind, that he was involved with some large-scale criminal organization and that he couldn't reveal any more information because he was afraid for his family. It was another obvious lie by a man desperately trying to protect himself. Jaberk's partners, Daniel Evans and Lamarco Roscoe, pleaded guilty to state charges of burglary, kidnapping, and armed robbery. They were sentenced to 30 years in prison. Christopher Jaberk was prosecuted by Assistant U.S. Attorney Richard Goolsby. The only problem with this case was that there was no scientific evidence. It seemed like we hit a dead end every time we got a lab report uh, as to any fingerprints or footprints. None of them matched Jaberk. But in terms of the quality of the evidence, uh, we were very fortunate that the teller victim and her family members were just incredibly good witnesses. Uh, they helped win the case. Jaberk was convicted on all six counts, which made him eligible for a sentence of life in prison without parole. While awaiting sentencing, Jaberk was held at a small county jail. There, he met another inmate. Jerome Frierson Bay, also a bank robber, was awaiting trial on three armed robberies. At the time, the jail was undergoing construction to expand the facility. That's that one guard, not that door. There was plenty of time to plan an escape. On March 27, 1996, a guard on routine patrol noticed an open door. 
A head count revealed two inmates were missing, Christopher Jaberk and Jerome Frierson Bay. Construction workers had seen two prisoners running toward a wooded area near the prison. Search teams combed the woods, but no one spotted the men. The search moved into the area's denser forest and swamps. And helicopters flew grid patterns overhead. Still nothing. Authorities believe the pair might have had help on the outside. Police tried to seal the perimeter, putting up roadblocks to stop and check vehicles. But the two escapees were nowhere to be found. Jaberk's escape posed a danger to the Shaw family, who had testified at his trial. We needed to contact the victim's family members and let them know about it and uh, to take other uh, precautions that you would in a, in a situation like this. While the search continued, Edgefield County, South Carolina deputies began spot checks on the Shaw family to make sure they were safe. I was convinced that at some point in time, uh, he would come back to the mother. We established a surveillance, 24-hour surveillance, of the mother and the girlfriend. Authorities watched, but Jaberk never showed. Then, FBI Special Agent Doug Fender developed a surprising lead. Myself and other local law enforcement officials were conducting a separate auto theft investigation in the Augusta, Georgia area concerning the theft of a green Mitsubishi Eclipse. We were able to identify an individual in jail who indicated that he had transferred this stolen vehicle to one of the female associates of Jaberk. Agents interviewed the young woman at the hotel where she worked. Initially, she denied any knowledge of the jailbreak. But Special Agent Fender tried to get her to cooperate. This job is uh, mainly about talking to people. When you put all the uh, fancy forensic techniques and uh, those sorts of things aside, probably the success of uh, most agents is based upon their ability to solicit information from individuals and, uh, and make them uh, tell them something that they probably don't want to share with you. When she realized she herself could go to jail, she admitted helping in the escape. She said that she and Jaberk's girlfriend delivered a stolen car to a parking lot near a wooded area by the prison. After he escaped from the jail, he just got into the getaway car and made his escape with Frierson Bay. They, uh, by prearrangement, went to a clandestine campsite, uh, which the girls had laid out for Jaberk and Frierson Bay with clothes and water and, and that type of thing. The escapees easily found the stashed clothes, food, and weapons. They were free, but they needed money. The armed bank robbers knew exactly what to do. In 1996, escaped prisoners Christopher Jaberk and Jerome Frierson Bay fled a county jail in a stolen car. FBI Special Agent Jerry Jones was after them. We began a search for the stolen vehicle, and we sent out an APB to all surrounding states regarding the description of the vehicle. The day after the escape, 
a car matching that description, pulled up to a bank in Lumberton, North Carolina, 220 miles northeast of the jail. Right, just take the money. Two men in hats, gloves, and sunglasses robbed the bank at gunpoint. The employees knew to cooperate so no one would get hurt. Come on, man. Let's Lumberton police and North Carolina FBI agents responded to the scene. They determined $4,500 had been taken from the bank's vault. Security cameras were rolling during the robbery. The images were too blurry to make out faces, but the descriptions given by employees resembled Jaburk and Frierson Bay. And the car they left in matched the one the fugitives had. I'll be there. Thanks. The car was the best lead for Special Agent Doug Fender. This vehicle we had entered into NCIC, and we discovered uh, or was notified by the Lumberton police officials that that car had, in fact, been recovered in Lumberton, North Carolina. An hour after that car was found, Agents received a report of a home invasion and carjacking in Lumberton and went to interview the victims. The couple said they had been working on their car in the garage when two armed men burst in, demanding the keys to the car and a change of clothes. then left as quickly as they had arrived. When shown a photo lineup, the couple positively identified Jaburk and Frierson Bay. And that's the guy that came up on the left side. So we had a second vehicle and we had an APB put out on that car. It was spotted in Raleigh, North Carolina. Jaburk and Frierson Bay robbed a bank there. The fugitives were heading north fast. We knew that Frierson Bay had relatives in the New York, New Jersey area, so we suspected that to be the ultimate destination. Tracking the pair became a matter of following a trail of bank robberies. What we noticed was a trend of bank robberies that were occurring up and down the I-95 corridor. At the time, we were tracking uh, Frierson Bay and Jaburk. We uh, suspected them in approximately 11 to 14 bank robberies up and down the East Coast. In some of the robberies, men matching the description of one or both of the fugitives were captured on surveillance video. We were able, through photographic surveillance and also witness uh, identification, to establish that the two of them were together at least until they reached the Fredericksburg, Virginia area. Agents focused their search in New Jersey, where Frierson Bay had family. Based upon two tips that were called into a nationally televised program, Frierson Bay was tracked to a motel located in the Patterson, New Jersey area. A surveillance by members of the New Jersey FBI office was established. Once these agents were able to establish that Frierson Bay uh, might be staying in the motel room, they remained on the premises. If he were inside and armed, approaching the door would be dangerous. It was decided to wait him out. Soon they would learn the fugitive would not go down without a struggle. After two escaped prisoners committed a string of armed bank robberies, agents believed they had tracked one of them, Jerome Frierson Bay, to a New Jersey motel. After several hours, they spotted the fugitive. He went to his car as the SWAT team moved in. Police, get out of the car! Get out of the car! 
He locked himself inside. But that wasn't going to stop them, according to FBI Special Agent Doug Fender. After several commands by uh, members of the FBI SWAT team, Frierson Bay still refused to come out of the vehicle, at which time one of the SWAT team members was able to break the glass with the butt of his MP5 submachine gun. Frierson Bay was then forcibly removed from the vehicle. From his car, the SWAT team recovered a loaded 40 caliber Glock semi-automatic handgun, along with $1,500 in stolen cash. A search of the motel revealed no sign of his partner, Christopher Jaberk. Jerome Frierson Bay pleaded guilty to 10 bank robberies and was sentenced to 19 years in federal prison without the possibility of parole. He claimed he had no idea where Jaberk was. Finding Christopher Jaberk remained a priority for Georgia FBI Special Agent Jerry Jones. We believe that Jaberk and Frierson Bay parted company and Jaberk began his journey back to Georgia. I always believed that Jaberk would come back home. The FBI announced a $10,000 reward and had begun the process of adding him to their 10 most wanted fugitives list when a media report generated a promising lead. Just a moment. A caller said she believed the fugitive was staying with her minister in Atlanta, though the minister didn't know Jaberk was a criminal. The caller spotted Jaberk when she went to check on the minister's house after the elderly man entered the hospital with heart trouble. An arrest team staked out the residents, dressed as yard workers. On May 9th, 1996, a vehicle pulled into the minister's driveway. When the driver emerged, Agents visually identified him. It was Jaberk. The arrest team moved in. Hands up, FBI! Hands up! Hands up! What do you mean? What do you mean? Hey, whoa, whoa, what's going on? Surprised and cornered, Jaberk did not try to run. When they searched him, agents found $2,000 in his sock. He was returned to jail, again to await sentencing for the Augusta kidnapping bank robbery. When Jabert was apprehended in Atlanta, we thought the pressure was off and everybody took a big sigh of relief and went home for a short period of time. Jaberk was not giving up. Six weeks after his recapture, he once again broke out of his cell. When Jaberk escaped and I received the telephone call, I responded to the jail to try to uh, secure whatever evidence was there, we found a uh, partial saw blade. When he got through the window of the jail, there's a huge double fence around the confinement area covered with Constantina wire. So he had to get over that fence and over the Constantina wire. Agents searched the grounds and the fence topped with the razor sharp wire. They recovered shreds of a prison uniform. And we actually found traces of blood there, so we knew he was injured. But he was on foot. They hoped he hadn't gotten far. So we began to, to trail him through this rural wooded area, which also leads to a swampy area 
probably around 10 square miles. We immediately brought in tracking dogs, which led us directly to the wooded area. So we knew the, the route of escape that he was trying to accomplish. As old as I was, out with the younger people going through the woods, and we tracked through there for days, for several days, without finding him. I then decided that we needed some uh, electronic gear to try to trace him. So I contacted the Atomic Energy Commission site over in South Carolina, and they provided me with a, uh, a helicopter equipped with an infrared system that's a heat-seeking system. They searched dozens of square miles with a highly sensitive equipment. But somehow, Jaburk managed to avoid detection and was still on the run. Four days later, an off-duty sheriff's deputy in nearby Appling, Georgia, thought he spotted the fugitive. The man was limping as if injured. The deputy called the station and other officers spread out to search the area. He was uh, tracked into a, a wooded area right behind one of the grammar schools and apprehended. Christopher Jaburk was again in custody. Two weeks later, he was finally sentenced for robbing the Augusta Bank and kidnapping Amy Shaw and her family. Assistant U.S. Attorney Richard Goolsby fought to keep Jaburk off the streets forever. Our role is to try to protect the community. That's one of our important responsibilities. So we were concerned and felt like that we should ask for the maximum in Jaburk's case. And fortunately, the court imposed the maximum, life in prison, plus five years. Jaburk was ordered to serve his term at the federal prison in Leavenworth, Kansas. Without the possibility of parole, his only chance to be free again would be to escape. Several weeks into his sentence, Jaburk was caught trying to do exactly that by hanging on underneath a prison laundry truck. Come on out now. Hey, come out. Nice and come slow. On, I'll see you. Come out. Nice and slow. Hey, come come on. on. Get out of there. He had nice. almost made it to the front gate. Jaburk was transferred to the Maximum Security Federal Penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia. Even if Harry Houdini was in the Atlanta Federal Pen, he wouldn't be able to get out, and Christopher Jaburk is no Harry Houdini. No one doubts Jaburk will try again. But now, he is held in one of the most secure prisons in America.